Good afternoon, everyone. I'm really excited to have Daniel Bo with me today. Uh, Daniel has done some really great things in the tech space. Uh, he's currently a VP at Shopify, but most recently before that had uh, built some really cool products at Helpful. And we were talking a little bit before about uh, video and, and how things <clears throat> have really moved towards more of a visual space. Um, and we'll kind of go in on that and a little bit of modern workplace conversation today. Uh, Daniel, if you wouldn't mind giving us a little bit of background on yourself um, and how you kind of got to where you are now, and then maybe, you know, talk a little bit about Shopify. You know, you had some really nice things to say before we went live. We'd love to dig in on that. Okay, sure. Uh, first of all, Joe, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Um, and hi, everybody who's uh, listening in. Um, I'm an entrepreneur from Toronto. Um, I was lucky enough to get recruited to join a startup right out of business school and law school. And that was the first uh, startup experience I had. That company grew, went public, and was sold to Infor. I uh, ran marketing and corp dev there. After that, started another company uh, called Ripple with one of my co-founders at the first one. Uh, and we grew that and sold it to Salesforce. And I worked at Salesforce for a few years after that. Uh, and then started another company called Helpful with uh, Farhan Tharwar. And about a year and a bit ago, a year and a half ago, we sold that company to Shopify. And both of us are now happy to be here at Shopify. Uh, along the way, I've also done a lot of early stage uh, angel investing. I, uh, I teach a class at the University of Toronto Law School, and I'm a pretty avid musician. So it's a, it's a side hustle for me. You asked, <laughs> you asked about Shopify. Um, <clears throat> Shopify is a e-commerce platform. It's like a retail operating system, has over 1 million uh, merchants worldwide. Uh, from some of the biggest online direct-to-consumer uh, merchants out there to probably someone in your neighborhood who has a small business that they want to get started. Uh, Shopify is all about empowering entrepreneurs and making commerce better for everybody. Uh, and the kind things I said, I mean, other than it's incredible, amazing business performance and great products, it's a really, really great place to work. Um, incredible leadership, really great culture. Um, and, uh, you know, as an entrepreneur, it, it is definitely the most entrepreneurial big big company you'd find it doesn't really feel like a big company at all um and it's truly mission oriented i mean the mission is to help merchants help them and empower people to go become entrepreneurs uh, which the world sorely needs so that's a bit about me and that's a bit about uh, the place i'm lucky enough to work that's awesome yeah I'm a, I'm a big fan of shopify love exactly what you said just really empowering entrepreneurs and providing a great platform that uh, you know, out of the box can do everything you need it to uh, versus having to to build something and kind of worry about that side of the business. Just kind of worry about what you're good at building something and, you know, Shopify can kind of help the end to end stuff. Um, I'd love to kind of dig in on on modern workplace. So Daniel and I connected on uh, Twitter, his uh, co-founder of Helpful. What was his name again? Farhan. Farhan yeah, Farhan. That's right. I, I couldn't remember, but he tagged uh, a couple of different brands, and one of those was Cloud App that Daniel had mentioned uh, to him. And uh, so I reached out and wanted to have him on. But what is, you know, the modern workplace, what does that look like for you? Uh, both a tool set, also just communication, uh, how people are kind of culturally, culturally integrated into a company. Uh, where do you kind of see things moving? Okay, cool. Big question. I mean, first caveat is, what do I know? I mean, who knows? Everybody <laughs> has their own opinion. Second caveat is, even if you know something, you don't know something about everywhere. And I think that's always uh, been one of my cautions about <clears throat> describing either the the one right way to build a business. Well, clearly, there's lots of ways. And the run, one right way to build a culture, you know, clearly lots of ways. And the one, you know, right future of work. So I think there's going to be lots of different futures of work and it'll sure. vary dramatically. So I, I just think with that caveat, it's important to say that like, um, you know, th this is going to be, my view is sort of like a subset of some types of companies. Daniel Doctor. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I, you know, it's funny if you, I think if you want to understand the future of work, one of the best things you can do is just look at what the kids are doing. And uh, I, you know, mentioned we had, we had started this company called Ripple. Um, and the insight for Ripple was that we saw this generation of millennials, this was around 2007, coming to work. 
uh, and they used different tools and different modes and methods of communicating uh, when they were, as they were growing up. And so specifically that was things like Twitter and Facebook, which kids liked at the time. Um, and so that was our impetus to thinking about Ripple, which was like, how could we design these new UX patterns, these new communication patterns, and then build them into a work tool. And so, you know, for example, like literally the insight, Ripple started off as a feedback tool. We saw that people on Facebook were putting this app on their page. This is when you had a profile page and it was called Honesty Box. And, and it was like you could ask and give, get people to give you anonymous feedback at work. Hmm. And I, I looked at that and I was insane. I was like, that's not or sorry, just give you anonymous feedback, not at work. It was, yeah. and, and it seemed like that doesn't seem like people would want that. And yet it was one of the most popular apps out there. So that, you know, always good to look at these counterintuitive things happening. From that was the insight to understand that like the way people were doing kind of HR at work was was kind of old school and it didn't really match what the next generation wanted. So yeah. we went out with this idea and promise about understanding that and started building features and iterating on that. And, you know, it resonated and not surprisingly with workplaces that had progressive young new uh, uh, workforces. And so our like flagship customers for Ripple were Facebook when they had, you know, four or 500 employees and, and LinkedIn and uh, Living Social and Guilt Group and HubSpot uh, and on and on of Eventbrite. And when they were small companies, because they did not like the traditional paradigm, the employees that they were dealing with because they had grown up with something different. OK, so why am I mentioning that? Because I think if you want to understand how we'll communicate at work and how we'll collaborate, I think you just have to look at what the kids who are going to be in the workplace are doing today. That led us to Helpful. One of the theses around Helpful was that we would um, build uh, video asynchronous video messaging into a work tool. And, you know, why? Because I was constantly watching my 14 year old and 15 year old niece and nephew at the time send images to each other and pictures to each other uh, in place of text or as an ad adjunct to text. And when you started to really unpack it, um, the question was like, why, why are you doing that? And it was because if you ask them, I mean, they would say it's faster. And, and what they really meant is, uh, a, well, this is something we all know, a picture tells a thousand words, right? That, that by sending a simple image of yourself, you could convey a lot of emotion. And so that was the sweet spot was like, hey, people want to convey humanity and emotion, not just dry text. And that video is a really powerful way to do that. So that was what, what we did. Now, I'll sort of stop there because I, I don't have necessarily that much more perfect insight. I have some thoughts, but I definitely think that the future of work is going to involve both live video and asynchronous video um, and in a way that we've never uh, sort of thought about it before. I think that's gonna be part of how people work. Yeah, I think there's a, definitely a, a vision where async can quickly become synchronous as well, like, uh, you know, you're on, I was on a chat with Apple today because uh, something they sent was was missing. And so mm -hmm. I was just asking, you know, what's what's the status on this? And it was all text, text based. Um, but certainly it'd be easy to see, like, if you can't fix someone's problem, there's a, a little link that says, would you like to, you know, go live with an agent and it goes to video um, and you you if you can't close it with a async video or an async screenshot or something, you can, you know, go, go real time. Uh, I, I think, you know, that's definitely a piece of it. And also like within the workplace, we've, we've seen, you know, trends with people working remote, obviously, uh, remote playbooks are being developed right now. Uh, we did a survey at cloud app, uh, last fall that showed, that over 50% of both millennial and Gen Z generations were working remotely anyway, uh, as far as office workers go, mm -hmm. uh, or wanting to work remote. Um, you know, the Bay Area is crazy expensive. People have to live further away from their headquarters. Uh, now people may get a flavor for what remote work is like, either good or bad. <laughs> so it'll be interesting to see what comes from all of this. But how do you think you know, coronavirus, all this kind of work from home stuff has really accelerated or uh, led to, you know, a future of remote work. Uh, yeah, 
Um, look, I mean, there's a few things that are happening simultaneously. One is like it's a, a you know one comment at Shopify we we've, we've used is that sort of our 2030 plans are now happening in 2020, and I think that's probably a fair understanding. We've had a giant forced <laughs> transition to a new model, and uh, yeah, you're going to find some friction. But I think what what you're finding is you kind of basically the the you know if you're familiar with this technology life cycle adoption curve um you got people living in the future right now and you got people living in the past and usually it takes a long time for that lagger group which is like half the population late majority to come over that entire population has been forced to move very quickly um they might not like it but um what i think will be revealed is we can do a lot more remote work and that the tools that exist today are actually pretty good and so what you're going to then find is follow on decisions. So I, I, I heard this morning a major Canadian bank was planning to basically get rid of about 40% of their uh, real estate footprint because they realized through this experience that they could save those costs and have people work either on different shifts, on more remote work, um, and that you know people liked it. I mean, I, I won't lie, even though I can walk to work, it's about a 45 minute walk. I, I like that I can substitute that 45 minutes on either side of the day with hanging out with my kids or you know getting some exercise. That's That's a major change in the amount of addressable time in the day to do things I want to do. Um, well, that's going to happen a lot of places. So I think real estate, definitely a place that's going to shift uh, and people are going to be aware that they can do more distributed work than they used to uh, do. Uh, and then they can use, you know, in-person time selectively. I think another effect that we're going to see is going to happen over the next, say, six to 18 months is there is going to be a ton of capital put into really making these tools really good. So I, I think as much as we've been living with Skype for 20 years and things like that, cloud app, helpful, whatever you want to call it, they're still very early on help figuring out how to build an environment where people work. Um, uh, let me give you an example. Like the, the laptop that you're using or I'm using, the main goal of it is not video conferencing. So the camera's okay, but not great. The microphone's okay, but not great. Um, even Zoom, right, which, which everyone loves because it's easier and faster you know, it's still a lot of steps to get going relative to, um, you know, I pick up the phone and say hello, or yep. I dial a number and I'm talking to you. Yep. And 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 we we still haven't got to that place. Now, I think we're seeing glimpses of it. Uh, I put a portal downstairs in my in my house. Yeah. And, you know, instantly, I'm tweeting that like, boy, I would pay to have another portal sitting on my desk, because a purpose filled design device that's really like a screen optimized for video, the camera mm -hmm. zooms in, it's got like tracking so I can walk around, it's got a audio tracking. You're gonna see money poured into these um, systems that make it way, way better over the next little while. So we're gonna see like that this investment area makes a lot of sense. Um, and and I, 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 I can't help but imagine that people will adopt them. Um, you know, you can just go through the chain of areas where we can make things so much better and I think money will pour in and then you're going to see great solutions on the other side of those things uh, for allowing us to work in a more distributed way. I, I think the third one I, I probably should say is also AR VR. Uh, I'm an investor in a company called Spatial. Uh, there are many others. I'm also an investor in a company called North. And, you know, Spatial is really working um, to take a vision where, you know, you put an Oculus on and you're you're teleported into the room and you can work with documents, you can work with kind of, I call it like office in the office in AR or VR. And it's amazing what was a concept. But what's interesting, and I, you know, I, I haven't talked to them directly, but I got to imagine all the phone calls of like, let's do a pilot or maybe we're interested have now turned into like, we want to buy this and we want to roll out for a thousand people. Um, and so I think that's probably happening all over the landscape. And that means that in about a year, I think we're just gonna have much better tooling for this model of work. Uh, last thing I'd say, by the way, we talk about future of work. It's also like future of geography. Urban geographies are gonna change as people you know, just don't need to spend as much time moving their, you know, basically their brain has to move from one spot to another. We, <laughs> we can keep the brains in one spot <laughs> and save a lot of energy uh, yeah. by moving the brains around. That's that's a really good point. Yeah, I I, I uh, wrote a few months ago uh, before even all this happened about how you know is the giant Googleplex a thing of the past? You know the big HQ that was like a big selling point for uh, recruiting and getting people on board, and you know a thing of the the late '90s, early 2000s where you had your 
uh, a cafe and your dry cleaners and everything all in the office. Now people are working from home. Uh, you know, is that, is it more the, like what you were talking about more people, this gener next, next generation of work is focused more on like balance and having that extra time at home. If you have kids and really not having a traditional nine to five, but more of a kind of broken up day. Well, that's a separate question. I think, I think we're already living through that. Like I, 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 um, yeah, I've always found that, you know, that line is, is a very blurry line to draw. I, but I just caution anybody thinking about this as like, oh, this is what it's going to be. I am pretty sure there's going to be very, for a very long time to come, work that's traditional work. You go nine to five, you show up in an office, you do your job. Yep. Um, we're talking about a subset of the population, but it, it will happen. I mean, I um, I can see uh, the the changes in telemedicine in, in, in Toronto, where I am, Ontario, where I am. You just, you know, people are using um services where you can you know talk to a doctor uh right away uh that they would never have otherwise uh done so i do think no doubt this is going to have implications for us uh, but i also probably one last thing i'd say is be, be careful of people like me who prognosticate and <laughs> be aware of like un you know un unanticipated things yep right let me, let me when, when steve jobs held up the first iphone it was about 14 years ago i guess and said to the world, this is, you know, hey, check it out. It's a internet communicator. It's a mobile phone and it's an iPod all together. You know, precisely zero people in the world at that time said, that's it for the taxi industry. Right. Yeah. No one saw that. No one saw that putting a GPS in this thing and then having people hack apps onto it would allow this. And I think what's going to happen over the next coming years, we're going to see AR glasses coming vastly improved screens or purposeful devices for this. You know, we talked about screen. Another thing that that's coming, right, is transparent screen. So the camera is not at the top, but the camera is right in the screen. So you can look through it and you can like look right at people so that you get all that visual nuance, which we kind of lose through this thing. In fact, makes it even more confusing. Yep. I think it's un it's unclear what's going to change, uh, what combination of technology and platforms that enable people to change is going to um, unleash a different workforce. But I, but I think it's, it's pretty, it's pretty fair to say it's going to be very different, I think. Yeah, I think so too. It just kind of, it opens things up a little bit. Uh, you may not have as much of like, uh, I'm sure you'll have more remote leadership. I mean, I know like an Adobe always wanted to have all the executive layer, like right there in San Jose. Um, and a lot of tech companies were kind of that way, but you may have, you know, a, a EVP or a C-level who isn't necessarily in headquarters. Uh, yep. Maybe they're, they're probably there 90% of the time, but maybe they're based, you know, somewhere else. Um, you're able to hire outside of your footprint, uh, 20, 30 mile radius of HQ, because you, you have a playbook now of how to like actually onboard and work with remote work. I think it's just building a skill set and going to open things up, like you said. Well, you mentioned leadership. That's a really good area where I do think leaders today are going to adopt tools much faster. So one of the variants that we built for Helpful was a product called LeaderCast. And it was essentially a tool that allowed uh, senior executives to quickly record in a sort of easy way, kind of created a teleprompter on your phone um, and manage the whole process for you of sending short video messages to their teams. And it, I'll be honest, like as we were talking to executives about this, it was just not in their mindset, right? For them, and th this is sort of maybe a good, the friction around doing these things is gonna go away. So today, if you go to most Fortune, let's call it 10,000, I don't even know if that's a thing, <laughs> Fortune 10,000 companies and CEOs, and you say, let's go record a video message, say it two years ago, that was a uh, multi-week process. It was like, let's get the script sure. down, and who yeah. are we gonna bring in for video, and let's get right. the makeup and camera right, and then they would sit in their office and it would be very scripted. There were some that were starting to become progressive on it. But now, I mean, we're going to shift to CEO walks out of a meeting and says, hey, team, I just want to share this conversation I just had with a customer and boom, broadcast it out. I think the um, the idea that video is like this formal scripted sit down thing is going to go away to it's like a much more authentic human thing. I mean, it's really quite funny, right? Nobody prepares for two weeks to stand in front of another person and talk to them. 
Yeah. That's all you're doing with a video. You're just talking yeah. to somebody else. But somehow that that sort of you know distribution of it changes people's perception. And so I think that is going to be the harbinger where executives use video to communicate en masse much more frequently. I've already seen this in internally at Shopify, a lot more video executives, both synchronous and asynchronous. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're going to be using these as ways to stay connected. And it's about emotional connection, you know, like making sure that as a leader, you're seen, literally seen, um, and, and sending a short message is very different from um, sending a, a text. And so I think that's gonna happen. I think once that starts to happen, it will signal to the rest of people and organizations that it's socially acceptable. It's professional and acceptable to give a short, authentic video. And you know, look, like um, my friend Mike Litt at Vidyard has been trying for a while to, and, and succeeding uh, at getting at p salespeople to use that, using video in, in a marketing context. And so I just think we're gonna see um, telepresence expand. Um, I think I've probably beaten that horse enough. I think maybe the second part about it is with that and what I'm unpacking for you, I think is an even further continuation of authentic human communication, less formality, less barriers to the leadership and more, here's what's really happening in real time uh, and let's react. I think, you know, everyone talks about, oh, what happened now was a shift to remote work. What probably isn't told enough is what happened now is a shift to, you have to make a decision fast. Like we didn't yep. have time for weeks of committees on whether we're going home. I mean, every major company was just forced and in governments. Now some did it better than others, but what's impressive to me is how many companies are gonna come out of this and say, you know what? We can actually make decisions faster. You know, we can get shit done. Like we can do this. Look yeah. what we just did. We moved our entire 20,000 person, you know, bank home. Yeah. Why is it gonna take us so long to make another decision like this? Um, and to me, that's probably one of the most powerful things. It's not like new style of work. It's not new video conferencing. It's new decision urgency that allows companies to make decisions faster because they realize that they can. And it also perhaps um, raises our expectations of dealing with big institutions and governments where, you know, it used to just be like, it's going to take forever. Um, and now the answer can be, well, like it didn't take you forever. You can do things fast if you want to. It's lack of will. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, and you know, you're speaking my language with the video, like at, at cloud app. I mean, we definitely have lots of sales, uh, organizations using our product for that. And then also like my marketing team, uh, we do this like 60 second vlog about the blog, uh, video before every single blog post. And it just gives kind of a high level. And I tell my team or myself like one take, ums and ahs, people walking in the background. Like my biggest, one of my biggest things at cloud app is like demystifying video right? and how it's, it's fine. Like people, you know, I've had like, you know, my, my kids are joining me on zoom calls and sure. you know, it's like, it's authentic. Like people appreciate that. Well, well so maybe another thing about the history of future of work that I think also will happen. We use authentic, but it's also like, it's less duality. And what I mean by that is there was a very strong, like, that's your work life. This is your home life. You know, this is your persona of who you are at home and your persona of who you are at work. And I think that's kind of like psychically difficult and has been for decades for people to be like who you really are and then who you are at work and how you can say things and what you do. Um, yeah. And what this, you know, experience is doing for people is reminding us of our humanity. Now, you mentioned the kids coming on the Zoom call. Not only do the kids come on the Zoom call, I kind of like when my kids come on a Zoom call. Yeah, it's kind and, of fun. and the, well, the reason is it changes the tenor of the conversation. Yeah. You know, if you think about a business conversation, you don't necessarily know people. And in certain cultures, North American culture, others maybe not. But what do we all do? We have like chit chat at the beginning. And what are we trying to do? We're trying to connect. How's the weather? What do you like this sports team? Did you like that concert? Did you see this show on Netflix? We're trying to find some commonality because it helps make it possible to have a conversation to build a little trust. That's a good point. Well, yeah. well when you have a kid pop onto a call with a bunch of like bankers, <laughs> like I had a call the other day with like a big financial institution and my little kid comes on. And what was amazing was the smiles. You know, yeah. one guy who was a CEO of a major financial institution was started smiling and he said, oh, I got my grandkids here. And it reminds us that we're all just people. Yeah. You know, we're all just human beings. And all of us are here doing this pantomime that we call work to try and 
help our families and get through what we have to do. Yep. And so I think that's maybe part of the future of work too, is um, it's an overwork. It's not, it's, it's removing the duality, right? You said work-life balance. It's, it's more like finding, yeah. finding yeah. unity, both in yeah. your humanity of who you really are and also in the way that you interact and find balance for the things that you have to do uh, at work. I, I really like that. I, I think that's great kind of segue to move into kind of the last question as we, we wrap things up. This has been a really fun conversation, Daniel. Uh, lots of good stuff um, that I have learned and, and just fun talking with you. Uh, what do you kind of see? Um, well, actually, let's let's ask, what is what have you learned as a leader about yourself uh, during this time? Uh, you know, there were <laughs> some things that I did and haven't done that I wish I would have done and, and need to do as a leader. What are some things that you've done well, maybe haven't done well uh, and learned about yourself during this time? Look, I always have places to improve my leadership and interpersonal skills. Everybody does. I think the one thing that stands out for me is taking the time uh, in a meeting, in a conversation, in a team to really check in with people and make sure that they know that you care about them as people is enormously powerful. Uh, I would say in my prior lives, I've been impatient, you know, startup entrepreneur, and you know, you get on and you want to just get into it. Um, and certainly if you work in a big company where you're interacting, you know, it's like this at Salesforce, you get on a call, you don't even know these folks. Yeah. And you're just like, let's get into it. <laughs> um, and what the COVID situation has done is it makes it not only, uh, you don't just do the perfunctory, how you doing? you actually ask the question, right? I was with one of my colleagues yesterday who is a single person living in a small apartment in Manhattan, hasn't gone out in six weeks. Like that's gotta be crazy making. Yeah. And, wow. and you know, I only had half an hour. I had to get some stuff done, uh -huh. but candidly, I spent most of the time talking to her about what she needed. We could schedule another call. You know what? That could be fine. We'll do that another time. Being more patient to make people feel comfortable and learn about them allows you to go faster later on. Because, you know, that allows uh, like my own rough spots when I may be impatient later to be uh, forgiven because people understand where you're really coming from. So I think as a leader, that part has been really great. And, and to be honest with you, I've loved it. You know, we have this thing at Shopify where you get a ping every week and it connects you with another random employee. Oh, cool. It says like, hey, go have a coffee with this person. And yeah. for my first year at Shopify, I did it a few times, but you know, probably bad on me. I'm like, what am I doing? Like, what, what is this about? And now I love them. I actually want to request more of them Yeah. because I learn about the company and I learn about my colleagues, <clears throat> I learn about the people I work with just by hopping on for half an hour with no, like, I don't have an agenda with you. You're, you're working in a different team in a different department, but I'm like, how did you get here? What's your story? What have you done? Yeah. Um, and every single time I've come away thinking, I learned something about another great person. I learned something about this company. Um, and usually I think, damn, why wasn't I doing more of this sooner? Because it's really powerful. Um, so yeah, anyways, like I said, I think that, 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 that learning about like taking care of people and taking a little bit more time, uh, to know their story and really make sure they're doing okay before you get into the work stuff is, is invaluable and uh, a good lesson for me. Definitely. Awesome. Well, thanks, Daniel, for your parting words of wisdom. Uh, it was great talking with you. Good luck with the kids. Good luck with uh, managing during this craziness. And I uh, hope to talk again soon. Thanks. Take care, Joe. Same to you. Good luck.